My name is Panos Panay. I'm Vice President for Strategy and Innovation at Berklee College of Music. And I want to talk to you about the Open in Music Initiative, which we launched about 18 months ago, that brings together the music industry to try and figure out uh, a shared way for identifying uh, music rights owners. Um, well, I'm giving this talk in Boston. Um, anybody knows where this building is? Okay, you probably know it as, what is it today, TJ Maxx. Uh, when I moved to Boston in 1991, this was actually the world's largest record shop and it was called Tower Records back then. It wasn't just Tower Records was a large record shop. This, was the, this particular building was the biggest one uh, in the entire planet. All four of those stories looked like this inside, and for those old enough in the audience, you'll recall those, those days where you actually physically bought a product. Today, of course, all that stuff can fit into our pockets. When I was a kid, this was a band. I've shown this picture to people under the age of 18 and they kind of scratched their heads who the hell these guys are. Um, but today, you can make music without playing a traditional instrument, as we would probably call over at Berkeley. You can make music without even being a musician, right? Your, your phone is not just a great recording studio, but it's also an amazing music instrument. And you can even make music without even being human. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but about a year ago, IBM's Watson collaborated with a producer called Alex the Kid and just did information from New York Times and LA Times uh, headlines, uh, Supreme Court rulings, uh, Wikipedia entries, was able to uh, analyze uh, Billboard top 100 hits from the last 40 years and, and denote um, stylistically both chord structure and melodic structure, juxtapose all that data against how people felt on social media and co-composed the song called It's Not Easy that went to number three in the Billboard charts. It's a good song. I encourage you to listen to it. If we had more time, it played for you. And of course, we once enjoyed music through vinyl records. Now we can access them on our wrists through virtual reality headsets, intelligent assistants like Google Home, uh, and even thermostats can sense our uh, mood and uh, actually recommend music, or apps like BioBeats can ingest information from our biometric data and personalize music to us. So what does it all mean? Well, things are moving really quickly. And the music industry's underlying infrastructure um, does, is not quite as old as this particular tower, but it looks very much like this. It's, it's barely hanging. Um, most of the constructs that we use to compensate people who make music today predate the invention of the radio or even the phonograph and actually date back to uh, this particular contraption, which in its day was even more revolutionary than the iPod. Um, anybody knows what this is? See, I, I love speaking at different audience about this stuff because, um, yeah, a music audience always knows what this is, but they don't know about a bunch of other stuff I'm going to talk about. So this is a player piano. Um, if you've ever seen a piano that you think is playing itself, that's a player piano. Back in the day, this was the first time ever that you could actually enjoy music without being physically present um, with a musician. So this is the late 1800s. Um, but this is what caused the music industry to invent a construct called the mechanical reproduction right. So every time that a reproduction of a song is made, the person who wrote that song is supposed to get paid. So when you're streaming music because a file of the, uh, of the sound recording is temporarily stored on your phone, that triggers a particular, a particular right. In terms of the music industry, the way that money flows is extremely complex. I'm not going to go through all the logistics of this, but I'm going to give you a few numbers. Um, an average hit today has eight different contributors. It has about 700,000 different 
lines of, 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 of revenue streams. And at its worst, it has about 50 different intermediaries between the consumer and the person who made it. And if there's one thing you need to understand about the underlying structure is that every song that you hear has two royalty or, or two rights associated with it, two copyrights associated with it. There's the underlying sound recording that usually the record label owns, and then there is the composition which is owned by the people who made the song and the people who are publishing that song. Pretty complicated stuff, but if you think about it, um, this is a recipe for disaster, right? Um, enormous complexity, lack of interoperability, lack of agreement between all these different platforms in terms of how data ought to flow, exacerbated by the um, generation of uh, user-generated content and, of course, sharing on social media and so forth and so on, which over the last two decades has caused uh, a lot of the industry to actually dry up for music creators. Um, just to give you a sense, the entire music industry put together globally, if you add it all up, it's about $31 billion. That's about the same value as the Apple App Store. It's kind of crazy. Um, so for me, it's not, you know, every single person in this audience listens to music, so it's not so much a market demand issue, but it's a business model issue at, at the end of the day. It, it shrank quite dramatically. It's beginning to finally uh, turn the corner right now with streaming services, but the underlying issues haven't been um, tackled. So let's see. We launched the Open Music Initiative uh, in June of 2016. Um, we've collaborated with a number of uh, academic institutions, including the folks of the Digital Currency Initiative at the Media Lab. But our objective is pretty simple. Create an open protocol for identifying rights ownership across the entire supply chain of the music industry. All the data about who ought to get paid and who owns what is now trapped behind dozens, if not hundreds, of closed databases that don't interoperate. So what was once found in all the liner notes, if you will, of all those albums where you could go and see every single person that was involved in creating a particular record, so not just the people who recorded it, but the engineer, the producer, all the side men and women and so forth, all that stuff doesn't really exist, but all those people are supposed to get paid somehow. So after a lot of effort, we managed to bring together um, practically everybody in the commercial music industry to agree to the creation of this open protocol. This includes the three major labels. So that is Warner, Universal, and uh, Sony, including uh, as well as uh, streaming services like Pandora, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, companies like Netflix, because they're, they all have to deal with the same issues every time that you stream a particular movie and there's music in the movie. But then also companies like uh, Intel uh, with their Sawtooth platform, and recently Alibaba and IBM um, Hyperledger. After about almost 3,000 hours of collective work um, uh, by all the participants done both in meetings and um, a lot of long conference call, um, we released uh, our API in late December, and all the API does is really connect these two um, uh, rights that I talked about, the sound recording and the composition. Amazingly, there's nothing that does that. So if you're a streaming service right now, you're ingesting about 10,000 songs a day, and you're supposed to figure out a way to match every one of the owners of each one of those 10,000 songs with uh, the way that you're supposed to pay them. Um, so if you've heard anything about the industry and all the lawsuits that have been taking place, that's the primary reason. Um, you know, the industry's come about to this concept of, of blockchain. When we first started the initiative, um, I think everybody thought we were completely lunatic to even talk about it. Um, but the concept of a distributed ledger and the idea that you can actually share data without anointing a new 
central entity to own the data is fundamentally what managed to bring all the different folks together. This is an industry that has attempted many times to tackle this issue, and its primary answer has been the creation of a centralized uh, database, or what was called a global rights database, that ended up collapsing over infighting about who owned and who controlled the data. So for this particular audience, uh, it's obviously quite obvious that attributes of blockchain are directly applicable in this. And of course, we believe that beyond just bringing transparency and interoperability, um, the smart contract uh, components can dramatically increase efficiency and even completely change the revenue stream um, and, the, and the fundamental business model of the way that music is monetized right now in digital media. And I know that some of you in the audience are developing a bunch of prototypes um, for this. Um, to catalyze innovation, um, we've to date orchestrated two summer labs in collaboration with uh, the design firm IDEO. We brought together students from different universities, including from uh, MIT, and had them collaborate uh, with a, a number of artists for this particular version of the lab last summer. Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank sponsored artists from the Caribbean to come and collaborate with each team of students that com comprise of blockchain developers, user experience designers, kids from Berkeley who understood the music business. And they worked on four use cases. I'm not going to go through every one of them, but one was, can you identify ownership during a live DJ remix set? Um, interestingly, the two most popular pieces of music today, or types of music, are what in America is called EDM, or electronic dance music, and of course, hip hop and R&B and rap, all of which are music, uh, types of music that actually are mashups of pre-existing sound recordings, which makes it even more complicated. So that was one of the use cases. The other was about um, identifying rights ownership during uh, of, of what we call a mixtape, or one of these user-generated uh, mashups that is shared on, on social media, and a few other uh, challenging examples. Um, in addition, um, we are next weekend hosting a hackathon in Salzburg, Austria, of all places. We're bringing different blockchain developers uh, to work on a particular um, challenge issued by Red Bull Media House to create a micro-licensing platform that happens in, in, in real time and the companies participating in that involve uh, SoundCloud, uh, Spotify, Amazon, and a number of others. So we're trying to create these controlled clusters or these safe environments for people to safely experiment with, um, with these angles. And then another thing that we're looking at Berkeley, um, part of my role as being in charge of the organizations or the institution strategy is redeveloping our IP policy but every single student that comes at Berkeley right now, the policy, the way that it's written, whatever you create while you're a student, whereas you own the underlying um, song, the sound recording you created, as if the two can really be separated in, in a digital uh, era, is you can actually not commercialize it. It's owned by the institution. And the approach for that is that, well, you don't really know who you collaborate with, so you can't really go and get clearance if you decide to monetize, monetize it a year or two or three or five down the road. And of course, we have a lot of world-renowned um, alumni, as you can imagine, that collectively won over 350 Grammys. Um, so we will be exploring the idea of each student getting, uh, getting what we're calling a creative ID. But think if um, you are effectively assigned an ID as a student that enables you to track uh, all the, uh, all the people that you're collaborating with during your time uh, at Berkeley, and that is not something that's owned by the institution, that is ultimately something that's owned to you and attached to your, to your um, creative ID. So, you know, if we're successful, a few things that we believe will, will happen. First, you know, the pendulum swung way too far on the side of what I'll call, um, you know, content platforms rather than content creators. So uh, it's not surprising that during the 20 years where the, uh, the creative part of the industry has um, nearly collapsed, that obviously the, the five 
most valuable firms um, in, on the US stock market are Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft. Um, we feel that um, a blockchain-based approach will shift some of the weight back to the creators and give them rights with respect to whatever they're producing. And that involves, frankly, anybody in this particular audience because we're all creators. We also believe that it can cap uh, uh, catalyze a creative um, explosion. Think of if every single sound that's ever been recorded, if it's available to you to take it and do whatever you want with it, and you're not fundamentally worried about who to pay. Um, if you are a young rapper and you're trying to get clearance for all the songs that you want to embed in your particular track, if you went about it the legal way, it would cost you about $100,000. If you want to start a new streaming service to, com to compete with Spotify, just to get all the licenses involved, would probably cost you about $100 million if you wanted to do it on a global scale. So if you look at any industry, ultimately you have to ask, are you attracting young people? Are you attracting capital? Um, are you relying too much on, on permission-based innovation, if you, if you will? And I, I think that's one of the challenges of the industry. So we believe that this approach can um, fundamentally grow and liberalize the industry. If you're a songwriter today, you depend not on dollars but on pennies, but you have absolutely no idea who is consuming your song. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the arcane details of music, but every time you, you know, after this presentation, if you hear a song anywhere, in your radio, in an elevator, in a restaurant, um, at a concert hall, at a bar. Right now, all the people that created that song are supposed to get paid, but you have no idea. You get a check from a thing called Performing Rights Society and basically says you're owed 53 cents. <laughs> but uh, It's based on some loose measurement, but um, not on, on accurate tracking. So we believe that people in this room could easily create applications that enable me to track in real time everywhere my particular composition or song is, is being consumed. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of new platforms that are coming about that we're actively exploring at Berkeley, such as artificial intelligence and VR and AR and the implications that we'll have with respect to music creation. But right now, the ability of many of these platforms to actually take music is, um, is extremely limited. Um, so, you know, our view is that we're at the dawn of a new era. Um, we believe that the future is around open, um, open protocols with respect to identifying rights ownership. And um, if I get even one or two of you inspired to jump into this, um, into this ecosystem and help create it, then we believe that it can really usher in a, a new era for compensation of the people that are making uh, not just music, but all kinds of creative, um, creative media. That's it. I have, I think, I have any time for one question? No, I'm done. Okay, one question. Anybody has a question that I can answer in like one minute or less? Can I cover 100 years of the music industry in one? Yeah. Um, would uh, this uh, model uh, facilitate uh, release music under open licenses, like permissive licenses? It would be up to you as a creator, sure. You know, the, the, the vision that some of the, again, we're not here to mandate a particular uh, application, if you will, or expression. Um, we're here to create an ecosystem. But there's, there's, you know, in the 200 companies that I described, maybe about 100 of them are, are blockchain startups. And some of them do exactly that. They give you the permission as a creator to embed in the particular file at the moment of creation permissions related to how you want your music to be, to be used or monetized. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.